Okay, picking up where we left off. I'm sorry about that problem with the computer. Um, where we had left off was the fact that the guy was in Hades at the end of Luke 16, being all self-righteous and stuck on himself and shaking his fist at God and all proud of himself for doing that. Okay, and yet he had absolute proof right in front of his eyes all the time that he could even talk to of Abraham being saved, of Lazarus being saved, of being able to see all those Old Testament believers all the time. And they could even talk to each other. Okay, so he had proof of the fact that what was said in the Old Testament about Messiah to come was true. And yet he still was hung up on being negative to God. Even when Abraham reminded him, hi, they have Moses and the prophets. Okay, that was in Luke 16 in the last increment. They have Moses and the prophets. And the guy says, oh no, send Lazarus back and then they will believe. And Abraham rightly reminded him, no, if they don't believe the Bible, they're not going to believe a miracle either. Because the Bible is a miracle, all by itself. Because it takes immaterial God talking to your immaterial soul to make the material Bible understandable to you. That's what 1 Corinthians 2 tells us. That's why you have to ask the ceiling and read Bible and ask the ceiling and then pay attention to thoughts God sends you and then test them for whether they're from God or from you. That's how the Christian is supposed to live. That's how the Jews were supposed to live. We now got the book in writing and its material, but it has to be tested as to whether you're making something out of it or, or you're reading it rightly and God will witness to you when the words are really his and when you're reading it rightly. And that way you get direct contact from God. That's the only way to get conclusive proof, period. Okay, so the person who's in Hades has conclusive proof because hello, this was back then, before Christ died. Everybody that was in the Old Testament was in paradise compartment of Hades. And the people who were unsaved were in the torments compartment of Hades. And then Ephesians 4, 8 and 9, when Christ died, he went to Hades. See, right here. He went to Hades and told them. See? See? who were once disobedient. See, it's including everybody, including all those people in the days of Noah. In other words, everybody from the beginning. Okay? He went and told them, Hi, I finished. I succeeded. I paid for sins. Now think about this. This gets to the hell question. If you couldn't still be saved, why would God go to hell and tell them about his victory on the cross? That's what the, that, that passage is telling you, highlighted in blue. Why would he go down there after, that was the three days that he was underneath the earth, his body is in the grave, his human spirit goes up to God, his soul goes down to Hades because that's where Abraham and David and all the saved people were. But that's also within hearing distance is where everybody else was. And he made a proclamation to what? The spirits in prison. Prison meaning the compartment of Hades where the rich guy was, torments, end of Luke 16, who were disobedient. And that goes all the way back to the days of Noah. He's lumping everybody together because he's making an analogy about how you're, you know, born again of water. You know, born again of the spiritual water. It's a, it's a long story. I don't want to get into this. This is, this is the positional baptism. See, it's not physical water. It's positional baptism in Christ. Okay, but I don't want to get off on the baptism topic. What I want you to understand is that he went and talked to the unsaved during those three days his body was in the ground. If they couldn't be saved still, though dead, then why would he go and talk to them? See, 
proclamation means good news. I ought to show that. This is talking about the gospel. Okay? See? That's the prison. Okay? Those are the spirits, meaning the people. You know, because you have... It's another nickname for your soul. Okay? That's him going down there. And this... Kiruso. This means an official proclamation. See? Publicly proclaim. Announce. Publish. This is another... This is a very frequent verb for giving the gospel. Okay? Make an official announcement. Okay, this is in um, Bauer Danker. To make an official announcement. Public declaration. Hi, I went to the cross. I paid for sins. It's over now. You can be saved. All right. And who is he ta who is he talking to? The unsaved. See, because the saved are already saved. That's for them. It's like, oh, well, we get to see him now. But he's talking to those who are unsaved. So that means they can still be saved, doesn't it? And why why else do we want to believe that? Or why else can we trust that? Well, Peter covers that too. Second Peter three nine. Okay. Let's do the Greek because I want you to see this. Okay. Lord is not slow about his promise, meaning his promise to, to make good on, his promise to come back, the promise of the rapture, the promise of the second advent. Okay, as some count slowness, they were saying that he's slow in coming back, but the rapture should was supposed to happen by now. Okay, because this is 68 AD or 64 AD, somewhere in that vicinity when Peter's writing. But his patient towards you, here we go, it's tamely translated, not wishing for any to perish, that's a bunch of baloney, okay? All right? This is word for patient right here. Makrothumia. That's got a great etymology, but I don't want to see. May. Greek word may. It is a negative particle which denies the idea. It should be translated, he is never willing. Bolomenos means never desiring. Okay? Bulomai means to desire, to want, to choose, to determine. Me bulomenos, never wanting, never desiring. Who? Tinas, anybody. Apolestete, to be, to be ruined, to be destroyed. Is the same verb that is used in Matthew 25, 41 about the lake of fire. But conjunction of contrast all will be have a change of mind and be saved change of mind about what about Christ okay so he is never ook okay not slow okay denies the fact of him being slow and then this is paired with denies the idea of God ever being willing that anybody should perish. The word for perish is right here. Apoleste. Apoleste. Okay. You see the point? He wants everybody to change their mind. Okay. And then choreo means to change, make room for come to, it's translated come to, but it means to make room for. You have to make room for a change of mind. A change of mind about what? About Christ. Rather than perishing, meaning being in the lake of fire. You're not, you're, there's no such thing as soul sleep. Your soul is not obliterated, but you're like a bombed out Dresden in your soul. Okay, God never wants that to happen. And so it's not a wonder then that you have Christ preaching to those in prison. What? The gospel. Why? 
Because God is never willing, never, this should be translated, never willing, that any should perish. Apolume again, which is the verb that's used in Matthew 25, 41, about destruction of the soul. Bombed out Dresden. The city's still there. It's in shambles. So a, a thing can be destroyed, but it still exists. Okay? Destroyed is not the same thing as obliterated. People should be more precise when they read the Word of God. God is never willing for that to happen, ever. That's what that Greek text says. Never willing is how you should translate it. So, therefore, since never willing, when Christ dies during those three days, okay, he is visiting who? Not just the saved, but the unsaved. Telling them what? Hi, I finished the cross. You can believe now. Okay, but they don't believe. Because just like the guy, the, the Luke 16 guy, who are all full of their self-righteousness, this is what kills me about this whole story. Just like they're all full of themselves, he was all full of himself in Luke 16. Okay, look. I saw the dead standing before. This is the great white throne judgment. These are the unsaved. Okay? You got the book of life versus the book of works. And it means good deeds. Okay, when it's saying according to their deeds, its Greek word there is ergon, and it means good deeds. Okay? Everybody, all the dead are standing in front. All the dead are standing in front of Christ. See? Yep, this is established by context. All right? All the dead. In other words, if you've been an atheist your whole life, once you're dead, you're going into the the into Hades, and you'll have no end of people telling you that Christ visited there. Okay? You will know what hell is. You will have no doubt about what hell is. You will have no doubt about what the Bible is. You will have no doubt about God's existence and who he is. Will you yet believe? Because Christ went down and preached to everybody when he died. Hi, I did it now. Sins are paid for. And you will have all the time that you're down there to believe. And then, at least 1,057 years from now, if not longer, there is what's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And whether you believed in Christ is in the Book of Life. If you never believed, you're not written there. Okay? And instead, you got the Book of Your Good Deeds. Well, your good deeds aren't as good as His good deeds. God deeds are better than your good deeds. Your good deeds were for people. Christ's good deed was for God. You can't measure up. All right? And you're going to be seeing him face to face. At that point, you can say, well, I believe. But look. Look at the text here. Do you see anywhere in verses 11 through 15? Do you see it recorded anywhere? That anyone says, oh, I see you now, God. I have proof of you now, God. I believe. Where does it say that anywhere in that text? It doesn't. Can you imagine? Just like the guy in Luke 16, who was so proud of himself for shaking his fist at the Bible, shaking his fist at God, even though he had 100% proof, all those years between hell now and the lake of fire, which is at least 1,057 years from today, nobody stands up and says, oh, I'm wrong, you're right, God, I believe in your son's payment now. Where is the text that says that anybody does that? It's not there. That's the danger of never believing in Christ, is that you become so addicted to shaking your fist at God, you become so in love with hating God that you would rather be in the lake of fire than admit that he paid for your sins. I mean, it's not your work, okay? It's not your work. He did it. He said, look, I did this. I made you. I birthed you. I'm your father. 
okay? I'm your father. I made you directly. You are not evolved. I am your father. See? Right here. That's God made you directly. That first and many others tell you so. So I paid for your existence. Yeah, sure, I knew you'd screw up. I paid for that. Take this free gift of salvation and you say no. Now what is a loving father going to have to do? A loving father is going to have to let you go back and stay in prison because you're electing the prison rather than what he did for you. Even though he even goes down to hell and says, hi, I paid. And you still say no? And not only that, but you're going to still say no in Revelation 20. That's the scary thing about this hell business. Okay? You don't stay in hell because you have to. You stay in hell because you want to. There's nobody here finally confessing, finally saying, oh, gee, Dad, I was wrong. You paid for me. You made me first. Genesis 2-7. You paid for me. I didn't listen. Okay, I accept it now. I believe in your son's payment now. Do you see any text there that anybody's admitting that? That's how hard-hearted they are. That's how callous they are. And frankly, that's how immoral they are. How do you say no to your own father giving you what's worth a bazillion dollars? If your father died and gave you an inheritance of a bazillion dollars and you say no to that, how immoral are you? He's entrusting his wealth to you and you say no? How immoral is that? You can be as moral as you want toward everybody else, but against your own father? You're immoral. So, atheists, look, I understand you got problems believing this. I understand you think it's this flying spaghetti monster. But God says you're the real use immaterial. And that he's your actual father. And he created your soul at birth. Now, how are you going to test that? you got to ask the ceiling. And if you're not willing to do that, then you can't call yourself moral. You can't call yourself objective. Because this is the mechanism. And you can't say it's brain out's invention I just showed you from scripture. So your argument is not with me. Your argument is with the Bible. Your argument is not with Christians. Your argument is with the Bible. And I understand that you'll have that argument, but frankly, do you understand now why we Christians find it a little hard to accept your intransigence? And do you see what future awaits you in case this is true? That maybe your intransigence is because you like shaking your fist at God and it isn't objective at all. And how are you going to prove whether you're being objective? You ask the ceiling. If you're not willing to do that, then you're not objective. I'm sorry. Peace out.